Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Big Apple. You're watching the Q's continuous coverage of MongoDB Local. MongoDB, of course, is a company the Cube's been following for years. We actually go back to 10Gen before the company changed its name to MongoDB to align with the, uh, the platform. And we're here at the Javits Center, the new Javits Center in North. This is our third year in a row doing what was MongoDB World. Now it's MongoDB.local, a much more intimate event. Went from two days to one day. MongoDB, of course, company tracking toward $2 billion, $28 billion market cap. High flyer, very strong growth company in the operational database world, not like Snowflake and Databricks, which get a lot of headlines, who do more analytics. MongoDB, of course, is, is on the operational side with Document Database, and I'm really excited to kick off the program with Joe Crony, Cube alum, he's the Vice President of Technology and Product Development, and Joey Marburger, who's the Director of Product Strategy and Design at Arc XP. Gents, welcome to theCUBE, welcome back. Welcome for the first time, Joey. Great to be here. Good to be here. So Arc XP, you, we were talking off camera about sort of the incubation of that. Why don't you guys explain that, explain your roles? Sure, so Arc XP is a division of the Washington Post. It actually was our internal tool used for high volume content creation for Washington Post journalists that was commercialized about five years ago. So this platform has everything from a CMS uh, for authoring content to a DXP for presenting that in digital experiences to a monetization and subscriptions platform to give you a full arc of services that are needed for high volume storytelling. And so, you guys essentially took something that you built internally for your own purposes and now have pointed it at the world. Again, it's like, kind of like AWS and, and, and Amazon. And so, but it's a very competitive market, right? There are a lot of CMSs out there. There's, there's open source stuff like WordPress. So how have you found the reception? How do you differentiate from, from some of those? So we started uh, uh, really building Arc around 2012, 2013, um, right around the time that Jeff Bezos acquired the Post. We were trying to solve a lot of the same problems that other publishers are trying to solve. Um, uh, workflow, just like no one's happy with their CMS ever, it seems. Um, and we didn't know it would become a, a software business. Uh, we were just trying to solve problems for the posts, but with the brand and the knowledge of the post, it, it kind of started to take on talking to other publishers, other media organizations. They were like, oh, we want this. And then so we started to develop how do we actually build a, a software business to sell to these publishers and then have learned a lot of uh, solutions along the way that our customers are very, very happy with. It's very true, true, Joey. I'm cursing my CMS all the time. But so you're, you're delivering something that essentially is purpose-built for a media company with media workflows and, and, and robust capabilities. And of course, the drivers in your business, you know, change dramatically from, you know, print to online, of course, is the obvious one. You know, but there are others, the whole economics of the business have changed and really kind of forced new thinking, didn't they? They for sure have, and we definitely are more of a horizontal platform, mm -hmm. similar to Mongo's story of growth. That's been the story of Arc XP, where we've seen demand not only in print traditional publishers, but also in broadcast, in commercial venues, looking to have a presence on the digital space. So, you know, our story actually reflects not only the editorial challenges Joey mentioned, but also the developer challenges that are out there. Many of our customers have gone from having their own homegrown technology stack with large development teams. And as the commercials of their business have required they focus and trim down, solutions like ours, just like Mongo, make a lot of sense. Uh, part of the story for us is a focus on developer experience. It's one of the reasons that my team loves using MongoDB is all the services MongoDB has for developers. The same is true for Arc XP. We have a robust set of SaaS tools for developers to access through our APIs and really embed workflows around high volume content creation for their editorial teams. Well, the other tailwind in your business is everybody, we see it in our business, every company is becoming a content company. They're going direct to their audience. I mean, you see this all the time now because look, it's harder to get earned media. Uh, certainly in the tech business, you know, our narrow little piece of the world, there are less tech journalists today. So people are going directly to customers, but they don't have the experience or the technology uh, to be able to, to your point, uh, Joe, put assets in market very quickly. You see stuff get stale because it's sitting on the shelf waiting to get edited. So can you guys talk about the tech stack? What's the tech stack look like behind this software? That's one of the real novel things about Arc XP is it is truly a cloud native tech stack from the start. So it's built in AWS serverless technology and we leverage things like MongoDB Atlas to make sure we have the high availability and uptime for our customers. We really take all the workloads into our platform so that our customers can free up their time for great storytelling. 
Joey's been focused a lot of our lab's efforts and innovation. And what are some of the technologies there? Yeah, so uh, I know we'll talk about AI probably more, but um, a critical thing for ARC is we have a very modern tech stack. And a lot of companies right now are like, what is our AI strategy? What are we going to do with AI? Um, are learning that it's the challenges aren't necessarily AI. It's that uh, we can't integrate with our system. Um, something's outdated, doesn't work with uh, modern solutions. Uh, but ARC was very much uh, primed and ready for that, which has allowed us to uh, already deliver several AI products um, in the span of eight months. Um, and we have many, many things coming, uh, but Mongo is one essential piece to that as we're working on our own um, uh, vector database engine to help with that workflow and speed to publishing. I, I want to I get into the AI, but, but before we do, I want to double click on the modern stack. Yes. So what a, a mistake that a lot of people make when they, they lift and shift into the cloud is they'll hard code you know, certain services. Think transcription, mm -hmm. for example, versus having an API-based system that gives you flexibility. Uh, is that what you're talking about, for instance? And there are, are there other aspects and dimensions to that? Absolutely. So um, Arc, we have our suite of applications uh, for very specific workflows. Um, but everything speaks to each other. It's completely integrated. Uh, we even have uh, tools like our IFX engine, which is an integration framework um, for APIs to speak to each other. Uh, we can be headless um, uh, and, and work outside of the system. Um, so when we're working with customers and developing products internally, um, we don't have to stop and say, oh, we need to upgrade this or upgrade that or have a lot of tech debt. It's just like, this is the feature, this is the product and we can start working on it uh, seamlessly. And you can plug in a new service. I mean, transcription would be an obvious one, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many different transcription services, it's kind of like a mini version of LLMs where they're constantly leapfrogging each other and they're getting better and better and better, but it's just still not as good as human you know, transcriptions, but you might want to use uh, you know, AWS transcribe one, for you know, one week and then the next something else comes out from Rev that's maybe better and you can use their API. That's something that you can accommodate in your tech stack, right? Right, right. And at the beginning, uh, as we were exploring AI products, AI features, we could just check everything, test things, compare models, things like that, and not have to say, like, this won't work with our system. Uh, so we could kind of just get going. Like we had all the ingredients to make the recipe. You mentioned lift and shift, and that's something a lot of our customers have gone through, and we've seen other platforms go through, and I've seen that personally at other firms. Luckily, Arc skipped that whole cycle because we started with a cloud-native system with a microservice architecture and event bus that Joey described. So that really put us in a nice natural position to innovate very quickly, while the rest of the market was going through those actions to move on-prem systems to the cloud, and end up with sort of a Frankenstein at the end of the day, frankly. Mm -hmm. We're lucky that we skipped that. that in other cycle. words, you started in AWS. 100%, yeah. okay. 100% started in AWS, uh, serverless technology, and that's one of the uh, real benefits we bring to our customers, as well as a competitive advantage as we look to innovate really quickly. You mentioned how there's lots of other services that are, are constantly evolving, whether it's transcription, video clipping, and Arc doesn't take a position where we force you or lock you into one system. Through things like IFX, we allow our customers to choose and integrate what they feel is best to extend the core platform. So you never had to do a migration? 100%. Uh, well, let's talk about AI. What are you guys doing with AI? I mean, the AI awakening in November of 2022, you're probably using, like most companies, machine learning beforehand, maybe doing some SageMaker stuff. We all know SageMaker's great, but it's painful. Now all of a sudden all this Gen AI comes out, you've got all these open source models and open source toolings. How are you guys taking advantage of AI? What kind of services are you bringing? What value does it bring to customers? So um, out of the gate, uh, before we just said, we're going to use this model, build this product, we took our stance uh, coming from a media company to really look at kind of the philosophy of it and the ethical sides of it. Uh, not just think, oh, like pure content generation uh, or image generation. We focused on what Arc does best out of the gate. And our primary focus at the moment is on workflow. Uh, so we've developed uh, our own internal AI platform that can leverage um, any model. Uh, it uses Bedrock and OpenAI and Thropic, you name it. Uh, so we also don't lock you in. Um, and we have a, an AI editor, an assistant that helps you with um, tasks along the way of content creation, such as summaries or testing alternative headlines, auto-tagging, recommending uh, photos, videos, 
Um, and also we have our own fine tuning aspect so we can train with machine learning um, on a customer's content to give them a, a, a bespoke LLM, if you will, uh, to then further uh, power those features. So you, you built a rag, is that yes, right? absolutely. It, tell, tell us more about that. So it's, it's Mongo and, and are using a separate probably initially you're using a separate uh, a vector database and then have you migrated to Mongo? Can you tell us what's inside. Yeah, we started with Mongo out of the gate. You did, out of the gate, okay. Yeah, Even we, when it was probably in beta, right? Yes, so, yeah, we've been, uh, they've been a great partner. Uh, we've evaluated other services, but we're already a Mongo um, uh, organization. So we're like, we have the solution out of the gate and solve the problems we needed immediately. Uh, and then for further augmentation, we've tied it into the functions we already have in the platform um, so it's not just going off of like a, a big open model. Uh, I can actually leverage all the content within Arc um, and do things at a very quick uh, pace. What are you finding with, with model? Because model variability is significant. Amazon talks about model diversity. I was just on a call last night with Amazon. We were talking about really explaining how these models, it's the right tool for the right job kind of situation. Are you finding that? And and of course, the other thing is just leapfrogging. Like every day, Llama 3 comes out, and wow, this looks really good. And yep. you've got proprietary models, you've got open source models. How are you navigating all that complexity? So uh, we compare every model, um, and every model is available. And uh, for each individual feature within our AI products, you can select different models for different features. You don't have to just say it's all GPT-4. You can say, no, we want to use like Claude for this feature specifically um, and validate it. So actually in our, in our tools, you can say, I want to kind of tweak this prompt, a custom prompt uh, around a feature, uh, such as say like auto tagging, and then pick a distinct model and then validate it by one validating the prompt um, and seeing what the results are and compare them yourself. But behind that, we're doing our own comparisons of running kind of a battery of tests uh, for the features against all the models to determine weights and biases, speed, accuracy, um, hallucination, uh, and then have preferred models that then we recommend. Uh, but then we allow customers to verify for themselves. So what's the best model? No, you know, right. uh, but Llama 3 is looking pretty good, it would you say? Good. And yeah. it, are you concerned? I was talking to a, a, a financial services uh, company the other day, and they were telling me they're going to build their own LLM. I was, it blew me away. They're going to bring in a semiconductor firm. They're going to do some custom work. Like, why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use open source? And they said, well, we love open source. We love Llama 3 is looking good. But when you read the fine print, we're worried that they could pull the rug out from underneath mm -hmm. us. Now, that's probably designed more for, you know, companies like Bike Dance, you know, with that massive volume. But do you ever worry about some of the open source modeling terms? Yeah, absolutely. And we're uh, long-term thinking about that as well as can we develop our own LLM? Um, they have, you know, hundreds of customers, uh, but even in the, all of the content within Arc, uh, we would fall short of the amount of information we need to actually develop a true LLM. What we're thinking of is right now is fine tuning helps kind of adjust that. Uh, but we think maybe we can, uh, start to create maybe SLMs, or MLMs, yep. um, uh, to size against like customers. But we think of that too, is like, what if one day. You know, OpenAI is like, okay, now tokens cost $10 a piece, like per word. That's made not tenable. Uh, so that's why we're also offering every model so we can look at what's cost effective and what works. Um, but nobody knows. So we're thinking <laughs> about that. It's changing every day. So we'll see. Nobody knows. And that's why you have to have a flexible architecture. So Joe, how do you see this changing the future of media. What's your vision there? I think there's tremendous opportunity for this to change media. You know, media has benefited from other AI advances in the past. You mentioned transcription. That's been part of the industry for a long time. Auto uh, creation of articles has also been there for things like sports stories and finance stories. I think that the future that we see is really the ability for these models to accelerate, amplify, and tailor the stories that our customers tell on top of the platform. And there's a lot of business concerns that come into play when you're thinking about these large models and their potential to disrupt the workflows. Um, if you think about the potential for automatic content generation, that could create the marginal cost of content down to basically nothing. And of course, that would mean the value of it is also not that rich. So if we look at the auto industry, we see their parallels in going to autonomous driving 
really going all the way to, uh, to a vehicle driving itself on the road. We don't see that being the best outcome for this industry today. We think there's a role to play for journalists, for storytellers to inspire these models, to be assisted and to curate what comes out. And so I think that's the future that we see is really having even higher content creation possible with a smaller team, as well as the fidelity, the personalization, the immersive experience that could come together. One of the things Joey's teams um, ideated and experimented with is not just kind of the tech stories, but also pulling together the video assets, other media assets, personalizing that to the viewer that's actually engaging in that story. So it becomes less of a reader experience and more of an immersive experience as they're uh, going into these stories. Of course, you think of WAPO, Obviously, you guys are in the heart of what's happening in the, the, the elections and politics. People worry about deep fakes. I saw Amazon, I think just yesterday, uh, they had this technology. I think they showed it at reInvent, but they, they die, now, I believe, are shipping it where they have uh, hidden watermarks so you can identify deep fakes. I do, thoughts on that? Uh, how do you see that You're playing out? Again, I know it's very unpredictable, but that seems like a very useful feature mm -hmm. <laughs> of the service that you guys obviously can get access to through Bedrock and other tools. The authenticity of the content is very important to our customers, as is the data privacy concerns for in-process content as well as published content. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons we've created this flexible architecture where you can choose your models is partially the open source or which one is best for the challenge at hand, but it's also the business concerns about where is the data at rest? Can they trust that model is being used in an ethical way? Can they make sure that their jewels are not being leaked out, out of their models? And so that's a big part of our strategy as we enter this market. And, and that's enabled, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's enabled by your partnership with, with the AWS as a platform, right? They, care, they take care of a lot of that. Is that right? Or do you, do, do you pick up uh, from where they leave off and add incremental value to, to, to create those those protections and I, mean, I think Joey can talk about the details yeah. at a, a macro level. Arc is a global platform. Mm -hmm. We benefit from AWS having multiple regions around the world right. and we locate our data and our customer workloads as close to them as possible. So for our customers in Europe and France that really want to make sure it stays near Paris, yeah. that's one of the things we're able to do on AWS. Yeah. From a technology perspective, Joey has done a lot of work to tune it to make sure we meet those customer needs. Right. So AWS so offers the, the kind of ingredients. Uh, they're very helpful with certain things, um, but you still have to really put them together uh, for how you want to use them. Um, to kind of jump back to the authenticity side, I think we're actually building into our AI platform is that, as a detection for, uh, we're starting with like more pure uh, text analysis, so you can actually say, was AI used in this um, at all? Uh, and then as, you know, deep fakes, which is not new, Right. Um, coming out. Uh, They're just a lot better now. They're just a lot better. <laughs> uh, I mean, I saw the demo of OpenAI's um, kind of voice uh, uh, duplicator where you can record 15 seconds of a voice and then replicate it. And they're like, but we're not releasing this for a variety of reasons. And I think they have the opportunity to set potentially a policy of verified uh, users or developers that are, like with those tools in their hands can be trustworthy. Yep. And not just mimic, say, Trump's voice to say something um, uh, that's not true. So we want those tools and checks as well to help journalists uh, in the long run. Guys, amazing story. Congratulations on sort of incubating inside entrepreneurs. Sometimes you know that word, and mm -hmm. and uh, in a in a really important industry. So really appreciate you coming on the cube, and uh, congratulations on all the work you've done, your partnership with Mongo, and look forward to seeing the progress in the future. Yeah, really appreciate you the much. time today. Uh, you yeah, you bet. Thanks for having us. Okay, keep it right there. This was our kickoff at MongoDB Local. We'll be here all day. The Cube. Go to siliconangle.com. Check out all the news. TheCubeResearch.com and TheCube.net. We'll be right back right after this short break.